I'll be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest Like sailors in a tempest Together And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see Good morning, everyone, or good morning from California. Anyway, good afternoon, all of those to you on the East Coast. Welcome to our uh, Lung Cancer Living Room, brought to you through our Voices Advocacy Summit. We are so thrilled to have all of you here with us today. Um, just a quick disclaimer before we got started, as some of you can see, um, Bonnie and I are back in the same room, the living room uh, that's filled with so much hope for so many of you, and we are thrilled to be back together, albeit six feet apart. Um, um, we're, we're, we're so happy. A panelist uh, today, as well as William Mayfield uh, and Jacob Sands, uh, both amazing physicians who I'm thrilled to have speaking with you all today. Hi, I'm Jacob Sands. I'm a thoracic medical oncologist at Dana Farber. Uh, very happy to be with you. Uh, very appropriate to start the session, as was done, um, to acknowledge the social injustice pandemic that's happening. Of course, we're all social distancing because of the COVID pandemic, and we are addressing the lung cancer pandemic. And, and although uh, we really pay attention to, to everything that's going on and how to move our whole society forward, today we're really going to focus on the pandemic of lung cancer and how we improve our treatments, uh, our diagnoses, and how we uh, provide better care to more people uh, throughout the country and world. Uh, I'm very excited to be a part of this. Always fun to be in the living room even if today it's remotely. Thank you so much for having me here. So, um, as most of you know, um, 50 years ago, President Nixon declared war on cancer. What we want to talk about, we know a lot of advancements have been made, but what we want to talk about is the advancements that have been made specifically in lung cancer. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of really exciting things have happened um, in the last decade as it pertains to, to lung cancer. And really in the last couple of months, um, we've had several uh, new drug approvals. Uh, uh, so we're gonna chat about that a little bit today. I wanna break it up into um, different treatment types um, so that we can uh, have a clear understanding for those of you who may be watching, depending upon what treatment you're on. So Jacob, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to you and let's talk a little bit about chemotherapy. You know, how has chemo changed in the last 50 years? Because I know a lot of people are really fearful of chemotherapy. Um, uh, can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's, that's such an important question right now. Uh, you know, we, of course, there's a lot of attention, appropriately so, to targeted therapies and immunotherapies. Uh, and this is something that is kind of forgotten or people don't realize is that chemotherapy now is not like what it was before. Yes, there are some, there are some chemo drugs that are newer and better tolerated, but on top of that, even just the medications that help prevent nausea and some of the side effects 
are also significantly better. So at this point, um, there certainly are some people who have nausea, but this is really not nearly what it was before uh, on, a, on a widespread scale as well. Chemotherapy does not necessarily cause hair loss for everyone. There are some chemo drugs that don't cause hair loss. Of course, there are some that do. Um, but, but by and large, chemo is better tolerated these days than it was 20 years ago because of the supportive medications we have right now. And so some of those supportive medications are really some of the biggest advances in oncology, aside from the targeted therapies and immunotherapies that are going on. Jacob is absolutely right on, on how far we've come with chemotherapy, but they're actually using it now to boost uh, the effectiveness of some of the targeted markers and, and immunotherapy. Can you talk a little bit about that, Jacob? Yeah, I mean, you're right in that, um, so in, in some of the targeted therapies, we're now doing studies of adding back in the chemo. So rather than have it be just the targeted therapy, it's the targeted therapy plus chemotherapy. And it is, I mean, it is interesting then on the academic side where we're saying, oh, how about this? What if we now add in chemotherapy? Whereas 10 years ago, chemotherapy was really all there was. And so it was a matter of studies of new chemotherapy. Over the last 10 years, these different targeted therapies, immunotherapies. So it is kind of funny now saying, oh, what if we add in this chemotherapy, which it used to be all there was and now um, may represent a step forward. And so we do see studies uh, now looking at that. From there, I want to jump into radiation therapy. Again, historically speaking, uh, patients were somewhat terrified because of the destruction not only of, you know, maybe a, a cancerous tumor, but surrounding tissues. How has radiation therapy um, evolved? Yeah, there's a lot that's going on for radiation oncology, and they're able to deliver doses in a, a more specific way, so really targeting that radiation to a more focused field uh, to be very specific in where they're hitting. And um, that prevents radiation to some of the surrounding tissues. Um, we've, we're now seeing a more targeted radiation for spots in the brain, for example. So someone, when somebody has some metastasis or spread of cancer to the brain, to be able to really focus, hit those spots without hitting other areas in the brain um, and protecting that. We also see, even when, when radiating the whole brain now, is a look at, well, uh, minimizing the amount of radiation that goes to an area called the hippocampus and that can potentially decrease some of the side effects to thought and memory. And so we're seeing improvements in the way that that radiation is delivered to minimize side effects as well. So they're, they're getting more and more refined in how they can deliver radiation to be able to effectively treat the cancer while really minimizing side effects. It's real, I'm always so impressed at what radiation oncology does and it's, it's been very informative to me to spend time down there and kind of see how they're mapping out their fields and such. Even from a, and Dr. Mayfield's not on right now, but from a, um, a radio surgery standpoint, maybe for those patients who don't uh, qualify for, for a, you know, a multiple reasons, I suppose, um, could maybe qualify for uh, a radio surgery. Um, with, with huge benefit. Well, to, to your point, that is a very focused radiation to kind of zap that one spot. And, and if people can't go to surgery for whatever reason, then doing radiation to really eliminate the cancer from that one spot in the lung. And, and there are some areas that you really, that we're not able, radiation oncology is not able to do this, it's called SBRT, um, focused radiation to an area. Um, but in some areas of the lung, they can really hit that one spot to eliminate that cancer when surgery is not able to cut it out. Let's talk a little bit about targeted therapy and what targeted therapy is and how far it's actually come uh, since uh, the first approval in EGFR. Yeah, this has been uh, revolutionary. I mean, the last really 11 years ago, we saw the first publication uh, the IPASS trial, it's a large trial that really showed that these targeted therapy really worked well for EGFR mutations. And although that was suspected, the trial actually enrolled people with EGFR or not. They just looked at these patients with an EGFR mutation and also correlated that with responses. And that was the first really clear, large-scale demonstration that EGFR-targeted treatment works. So that's 11 years ago. 
And in the past 11 years, we now have multiple drugs for EGFR mutations, and we have others with multiple drugs and many FDA approvals at this point. So ALK translocation, ROS1, BRAF V600E, NTREC, most recently MET exon 14 mutation, now uh, approved, selpercatinib and blue 667 also for ret fusion, selpercatinib now FDA approved, but blue 667 also with good data. So we have multiple drugs now for multiple targets, and, and these drugs are by and large very effective, and the side effect profile is pretty good. Um, so this has been, has been huge. Now getting mutation testing, this has been important for a while, but now really getting full panels becomes even more important because by having those full panels, we also have all of those different uh, alterations that help guide that specific therapy. Now, I've mentioned those are the FDA-approved ones, but we also have KRAS now with a, a drug, uh, two drugs um, in trials that have been really impressive, well-tolerated, and we're seeing a good degree of responses. HER2 also as well. So getting those panels of uh, seeing all these genomic alterations really goes beyond what's even just FDA-approved because there are drugs in clinical trials that, that are impressive and, and appear effective, and um, we need to continue those trials, but those become other options for people as well. These different mutations make up certain percentages of pieces of the pie, right? And you mentioned KRAS, which I think is so important because it, ma yeah, it, yeah. it makes up a big piece of the over overall pie. So um, the fact that a lot of work is being done uh, in that area is, is fantastic. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, what you did and didn't know about your cancer when you were diagnosed? Sure. Way back in, in another century when I was <laughs> diagnosed with, with lung cancer, uh, the only things that were offered were chemo and radiation and, you know, get your things in order because they're not going to last long. But, you know, as an introduction to Dr. Mayfield, I just want to throw on the table that I had a um, very innovative surgeon that um, asked me what I wanted him to do for me. And he put together a program of chemotherapy and radiation, but surgery as well which in those days was not an option. So that may segue everything we're talking about because I think we're entering into the era of both personalized medicine and chronically managed lung cancer is my dream. You were sort of a very unique, I was going to say experiment. But experiment, <laughs> absolutely. Um, where you did have yeah. neoadjuvant chemo and radiation, right. then surgery, then adjuvant radiation. So it, for t that was early 2004. By the time you did that, that was un unheard of. Heard of. Um, so anyway. But I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now let's talk about what has been the, la the, the hot topic for the last, um, you know, couple, two, three years, um, at least in the patient community, and that's immunotherapy. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time here because I think, you know, a lot of good work was done in this direct-to-consumer marketing around immunotherapy and what it is, um, but I think it caused some confusion for at least up front, who, commu who, who immunotherapy was appropriate for. Um, and I, I, I want to start there, and then I want to talk about how that who has even gotten to be a bigger pool of people. So, Dr. Sands? Yeah, you, so first of all, I think it's important to, to just state that these different drugs work really well for different people. And there are some people where I'd say, okay, you really should be on the targeted therapy and others where targeted therapy is not going to be as effective because there's not that genomic alteration. Similarly with immunotherapy, there are certain aspects of someone's case 
right? So immunotherapy is a great option for you and others where immunotherapy is not the right treatment for that person at that time. Um, and so that being said, uh, whenever someone is diagnosed, we need to know the genomic alterations. If there is a genomic alteration, that is what you want to treat. If there is not a genomic alteration, with an approved therapy, it's, there may be some that are in trials and whatnot where it's a different, slightly different circumstance. Uh, it's hard to make blanket statements that are true for every single person on the, on the, that's watching this. Um, but generally speaking, absolutely want to know the genomic alterations to start with. If there are not any targeted therapy options, uh, then we also look at PDL1 expression. That's a, that's a receptor on the surface of cells, and that can help guide treatment. But that being said, uh, immunotherapy has worked really well for a subset of people. And I think we're still working out a better way of identifying who that treatment is really going to work well for. But in the best case scenarios, we're seeing people with, who, who were diagnosed with stage four disease who are on the immunotherapy for two years. And then the debate right now is, do you stop at two years or do you give it longer? Because in the trials, it was given for two years. Um, and by and large, I tend to stop at two years. And there are people that I am following with scans that don't have any clear evidence of disease. Now, some people, we do see that show up again a little further on down the line, even after having stopped the immunotherapy. And others that I am following, and is their cancer still there, I will see. But it is, it is possible that there are being people cured of their incurable disease with these immunotherapies. And this is a, this is a small subset of people. Um, this is a debated kind of a thing. Is it a cure? Is it not? We need to follow for longer. Oncologists are hesitant to say that word without it be really being true. We certainly don't want to say that and have it be wrong. Um, but it, it just goes to say that this, the, the, that immunotherapy is working exceptionally well for a subset of people. And there's a lot of research around better identifying who is going to be the individual that has such an exceptional response to treatment and how can we increase the number of people that have that kind of a response to therapy. And so that's where we're looking at different combinations that hopefully will have that kind of effect on more cancers uh, so that more people really benefit with, to such a big degree. So Jacob, we we talked a lot about a lot of these different therapies today, most of which pertain mostly to the non-small cell lung cancer patient. But um, can we talk a little bit about small cell and some of the approvals and um, advances that are being made? Yeah, so the immunotherapies really have been revolutionary in small cell lung cancer, and and. Again, it's a, it's a subset of people, um, but I have somebody I saw last week who just finished two years of treatment. So this is somebody who got four cycles of chemotherapy plus immunotherapy, and now is two years in, having gotten the immunotherapy th throughout the two years, um, every three-week, 30-minute infusion. This person has not really experienced any side effects. Many people don't. There are some side effects that can happen, but by and large, pretty well tolerated. And two years out now, we, she got her last infusion, and now we're going to follow scans. You know, small cell lung cancer is a disease that, uh, fortunately, the, the initial chemotherapy has worked really well. I mean, the first chemotherapy for small cell works very, very well. Um, but many people have that cancer growing again, um, the, the majority certainly within a year, but even six months. And now this is someone who two years out has ongoing disease control. Now, how long that's going to work, we'll see going forward. This is newer in small cell lung cancer than in non-small cell. Um, but, but again, we see a subset of people that really have very long, ongoing responses to therapy, which has been very encouraging. So then the question becomes, how do we, how do we try and what kind of combinations can we do so that this works for more people even? I want Dr. Mayfield uh, to give a shout out and say hello to everyone. Um, tell us a little bit about who you are, and then I want to jump into some s surgical options and how those have evolved before we jump into the screening. Mm.
Sure. So uh, good afternoon, and uh, I hope the audio is working now. We've rebooted about three times. <laughs> so I am a, uh, uh, a general thoracic surgeon at Wellstar Health System in metropolitan Atlanta. I've been in practice for about 30 years and treat a lot of uh, thoracic oncology. Um, we, uh, um, we specialize in minimally invasive thoracic surgery, uh, which is one of the things uh, we can talk about. So uh, the majority of people who walk in off the street to their physician's office with symptomatic lung cancer uh, are at an advanced stage. So we need to shift the stage of people who, are, um, who we see with lung cancer. And the way we do that is with lung cancer screening. So what we want is early detection because we can uh, treat and cure early stage lung cancers. So we've set up uh, you know, lung screening programs all around the country and um, uh, we are seeing in our screening programs you know, about one in 40 patients will detect a lung cancer and instead of 80% um, of the patients um, presenting in late stage uh, and 20% in early stage, Actually, 80% of our patients in lung screening uh, present in stage one and two, and um, uh, so those are very uh, treatable and curable with uh, uh, a combination of surgery and sometimes surgery and, and chemotherapy. So let's let's step back just for a quick second and talk about surgery and surgical options. I know Bonnie spoke earlier about her surgery back in. Um, uh, March of 2004, um, where she had an open uh, thoracotomy, um, it was a pretty major surgery. How have some yeah. of these um, therapies or, or surgical options changed? Yes, so um, when I trained uh, 30 years ago, in fact, we did do thoracotomies uh, for lung cancer and, a, and esophageal cancer. A thoracotomy is a long, it can be a 12, 14 inch, uh, inch incision on the chest, uh, separating the ribs, um, taking portions of the rib out for access, and then uh, with your eyes and sometimes using microscopes, uh, uh, meticulously perform uh, the operation, what we call open. Uh, about 15 years ago, right about the time you had your surgery, Mrs. Dario, uh, minimally invasive thoracic surgery was developed. And uh, so now 98% of the lobectomies and segmentectomies or wedge resections that I do are done through what I call Band-Aid incisions, two small uh, Band-Aid incisions with the use of a five millimeter diameter endoscope. So a little endoscope about the size of a soda straw goes into the chest. We make uh, one incision under the breast, one in the armpit, and then um, using uh, video uh, visualization and what I tell my uh, patients that are magic wands, <laughs> we're able to, um, uh, to go in and uh, dissect around the structures, the blood vessels and the airways that we need to, divide the blood vessels and the airways that we need to, and then compress the lung, because it's like a sponge, it's very uh, compressible, put it in a compression bag and, and extract it through the small incision in the armpit. Uh, you know, it used to be that the average length of stay for a patient after a thoracotomy was seven to nine days. They'd spend time in the ICU and have epidurals and things. We now uh, don't use the ICU, don't use central lines, don't use epidurals. We put a long-acting local anesthetic block in, and um, the median length of stay in our hospital uh, is two days or three days, depending upon the surgeon who does the surgery. Which is just big. incredible and a big, big change. Um, I remember when when you went through it all of those years ago, and it was a big deal, and it may still be for you, given your yeah. aortic and subclavian artery uh, involvement, that yeah. you would still have to have um, an open surgery. So for someone who does have more extensive involvement, say if... Uh, uh, it, you know, invades the mediastinum or does invade the aorta subclavian, that is not an endoscopic operation. So yeah. um, uh, we have to make sure that we understand that for the earlier stage lung cancers, video-assisted surgery, minimally invasive surgery, for those that involve more than many of those need to be done. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things um, I want to ask you, Dr. Mayfield, and, and Dr. Sands, feel, feel free to 
chime in and have a discussion with us about this is um, physicians working together and how important it is. So if we're talking about surgery, you know, and, a, and your thoracic surgeon working with your, maybe your medical oncologist, your radiation oncologist, or both, particularly as it pertains to any, you know, neoadjuvant or pre-surgical treatment and or adjuvant post-surgical treatment. What does that look like today as opposed to, you know, we started this with a 50-year war on cancer, right. but what does that look like and how has that changed? Well, I can, I can tell you how it looks at Wellstar. Uh, 14 years ago, we developed what's called the STAT clinics, the multidisciplinary thoracic oncology clinics. So four times a week in our health system, uh, in the same room at the same time with the patients in the clinic are the thoracic surgeon, the pulmonologist, the radiation oncologist, the medical oncologist, uh, the nurse navigator and nutritionist. Uh, so we have this entire team there and our patients come in to the clinic and if you have a pulmonary nodule, then we meet, we look at the scans, and it is decided then, should the uh, interventional bronchoscopist get the diagnosis, should the radiologist get the diagnosis, should the surgeon get the diagnosis. So there is a plan developed, and within seven days we have a diagnosis, and we have staging, and we see that patient back seven days later. If it is a lung cancer, it is staged, and then the same group, the thoracic surgeon, medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, plan the treatment for that patient, and within seven days, we have initiated that treatment, whether it's surgery or chemotherapy. So that is a real-time uh, multidisciplinary clinic. It requires a lot of dedication by the folks uh, to do that because it's slightly less efficient for the doctors, but it's exactly what the patients need. And as I understand from hearing our patients, the hardest part about having lung cancer is the waiting. And when I see patients um, who are being worked up for a diagnosis or worked up for staging in the community and, and come through to see us later on, I see these processes taking, you know, six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks. It's very concerning to me because um, the, the uh, PLOS uh, publication, PLOS study, showed that a six-week delay in time to initiate therapy for stage one lung cancers uh, reduced uh, survival at five years by 13 or 14 percent. So real-time multidisciplinary care to me is the ultimate model for how we should be caring. And do you know how important that is to the patient and how confident it makes them feel because they've now had about 20 eyes on their lung cancer rather than just two and that a consensus has been created on the absolute best treatment for that patient. The patient walks out and they don't have to worry anymore. They know they've got a team. In our um, uh, model of care, they don't get a second opinion. We get four opinions. We get four opinions, and it's real time, simultaneously. We're all looking at the same images. We're all examining the patient. We're all talking to the family. We learn the, you know, the social preferences, the, the support system that the patient has. Uh, we learn their, you know, whatever their medical biases are. Uh, but we all do it together, real time, and uh, it's it's made a dramatic uh, difference in our, you know, community. If, if you're curious as to whether or not you are receiving this type of multidisciplinary care, you can ask your physician. Um, quite often um, they're called tumor boards or tumor conferences where, um, where the whole team gets together to meet. I mean, I think it's important to mention that not every case um, necessarily gets presented at tumor board. There are some cases where it's very, very clear what is the right standard mm -hmm. of care to do in that case. And it's the cases where there's any complexity or any level of combined treatment that then get presented for uh, everyone to weigh in on and develop a plan for. But if you have a question about it, certainly ask. 
uh, ask your oncologist or, or your physician about whether you've been discussed at Tumor Board, whether there were other opinions. The other thing is in our department, we will have a meeting with a thoracic group at Dana-Farber where it's just a complicated medical oncology case and that's something that we all discuss within our group. So it's not involving necessarily all the other groups, but saying, hey, from a medical oncology standpoint, this is something that is somewhat challenging, and you get the opinions of all the other medical oncologists. So it can be a little bit different depending on the specifics of the case, just to keep in mind. Dr. Sands and I were discussing last week, you know, we really need an updated repository that's available, uh, you know, nationwide, online access, uh, to know, you know, what is the latest and greatest. There are people like me, like Dr. Sands, who all we do is thoracic oncology. If you're the average general medical oncologist, you're treating lymphomas, you're treating sarcomas, you're treating lung cancers, you're treating esophageal cancers, you're treating melanomas, and so you're not the specialist in each one of those um, uh, subcategories. So having access to the, the, this kind of up-to-date information is, is very important. If there's one take-home point on lung cancer, it's was genomic testing done? To what extent? A full panel or just a few things? And then consideration of getting a second opinion at one of the larger academic centers, not just for is the standard of care being followed. I think many oncologists are following that, but you should make sure there's genomic testing, of course. But also, is there a clinical trial of some kind of targeted therapy drug? And, and if I can just make a plug on clinical trials, I think there's a misconception out there that all these trials are versus a placebo. And I very commonly hear people saying, oh, I don't want to get a placebo. And nobody is coming in with a new diagnosis of lung cancer and getting placebo. These clinical trials are taking, across the board in general, clinical trials are the best known treatment versus something that, that there's evidence that this may in fact be better. And so there are, these, at the beginning I mentioned that there are certain genomic alterations that we have targeted therapies for that are very promising, that are not yet FDA approved. And so even beyond, if you got the full genomic panel, you know all the genomic alterations of your, of your cancer, is there something that's really promising that's not yet available in all of the clinics? And that's something to find out about. And, and once you've gotten that opinion, then getting treated at the center closer to your home in many cases absolutely makes sense, but just verifying that with one of the larger academic centers, I think there's value in that. In the biomarker testing space, particularly when it comes to surgery, are you running biomarker testing on those early stage patients, um, either with tissue or, or plasma? Um, if so, what stage and um, how, does, how does that work? Well, for us, um, in a stage one uh, lung cancer, uh, we don't typically uh, run the biomarkers on those patients because um, uh, a monoclonal antibody or, or a pd one drug is not indicated in those patients, but we always preserve the tissue for a future study uh, for those biomarkers should the patient have a recurrence. And we, we do have to remember that after surgery, up to, in, in many studies, up to 30% of stage one uh, uh, patients will recur. So we have to have that tissue to look at what the biomarkers were, and then when they recur, uh, is there some mutation of uh, some of those cells uh, in, in, the, in the new uh, reemergence. In stage ones, we would not uh, normally do biomarkers. Everything else, we send the tissue out for uh, biomarkers. And I, and I do want to uh, bring to light what we uh, at least was reported at the National Lung Cancer Roundtable, that only 50% of patients in the United States who should, uh, with lung cancer, who should have biomarker testing are getting that biomarker testing done. That is an abysmally low rate. And so the number one uh, focus uh, has to be biomarkers, biomarkers, biomarkers. And uh, then we move into the proper uh, treatment uh, and make sure they're properly staged. And, uh, and then the clinical trials. And totally agree with the Dr. Sands that um, uh, we, we and everyone out there should have access to clinical trials in every single stage of histology of and mutation of lung cancer. The one take home I think on lung cancer is uh, make sure that you do have, or if there's one take home, it's make sure that genomic testing has been done at diagnosis. Now that's really for stage four. That being said, there is a recent uh, presentation at ASCO, the big, lung, uh, the big uh, cancer conference, 
uh, each year, and this year it was virtual, but in there there was data for after surgery, if it's beyond a certain size, uh, if, if there's a, a type of EGFR mutation, then being on targeted therapy may really add some benefit. That was pretty compelling. There was a lot of debate about the, the specifics of that trial at this time, but it's a hint of things to come. We'll see. This is, this is something that may end up being approved. Right now, I'd say the standard of care, what's really defining the treatment in those early stage cancers that have been cut out, the genomic testing is not guiding treatment unless that one that I just mentioned becomes an approved standard. Um, that being said, this is very much an area of research. So within the Alchemist trials, for example, there are, these have been ongoing. When there's an EGFR mutation, an ALK translocation to, have, to be on targeted therapy, there are other studies as well that are, that are looking at that, including the one I just mentioned. And then just to put in a plug, if I can, um, in early stage lung cancer that has not, uh, that, that does not have an alteration, we now have a trial that, that is just fully approved and open and now being um, going through the approval process at each of the hospitals where if there's not a target and looking at immunotherapy and adding immunotherapy to chemotherapy. And that's one of the Alchemist trials as well. And, and so we're looking at non-targeted um, therapy using immunotherapy in those early stage settings also. You know, how, how important is it that a patient receive or tr at least try to get their surgery from a thoracic surgeon versus a general surgeon or even a cardiothoracic surgeon? And what should patients be asking um, their physicians before um, jumping into surgery? Yeah, so first you have to uh, understand that I'm a practicing thoracic surgeon and, and so I don't want to be um, perceived as being self-promoting. So what I will do is uh, quote two things. Number one, for the first 15 years of my career, I did both cardiac surgery and thoracic surgery. I was in about 75 or 80 lung cases, you know, pulmonary cases a year, several hundred cardiac cases a year. I thought I was doing a lot of thoracic surgery, thought I was pretty good at it. Now that I'm doing 350 thoracic cases a year and no cardiac surgery, I know that I'm a much better thoracic surgeon than I was when I was splitting my time. So just personal experience. The second is uh, the data very clearly shows that the uh, mortality rate for a lung resection by non-board certified thoracic surgeons um, is higher than that with uh, th you know board certified thoracic surgeons. So um, that is out there, it's very clear. So I strongly urge patients to seek care by a what we call general thoracic surgeon. Not somebody who's doing it part-time with cardiac surgery. Not someone who does a couple of cases a year as a general surgeon, but someone who's doing it full-time, uh, thoracic, general thoracic surgeon. That's what they do. And not only do they do the surgery better, they interact with their medical and radiation oncology, uh, oncology colleagues better. We are talking all the time. We're seeing patients in multidisciplinary clinics I'm up to date on the chemotherapy and on the PDL ones and on the on the uh, target therapies, the mutations, things like that. If if your focus is primarily 90%, you know, general surgery, that's just not a world that you know very much about, and you don't align your therapy with your medical oncologist and radiation oncologist. So, this is a shameless plug, shameless plug, that um, you seek uh, out a high volume general thoracic surgeon that has experience in doing minimally invasive thoracic surgery. Um, there are benefits to having minimally invasive, whether it's video assisted or whether it's robotic. Thank you. Um, so I want to jump into screening and I know a lot of people again watching live now or that will come back and watch live later um, are either you know folks who are currently diagnosed with lung cancer or caregivers of them but I always like to say um, you all are the perfect voices and have the perfect opportunity to be the voice behind advocating for screening. Um, so I want to make sure that we spend some time talking about um, screening, the who should be getting screened, um, the, you know, the who, what, when, where, and why of screening so that you all can go back out uh, to your families, friends, 
loved ones um, who, who meet these, uh, this criteria and have conversations with them um, about, about screening. So, so Dr. Mayfield, can you talk a little bit about, let's start with maybe the, 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 the qualifications or the criteria for screening and then we'll jump into what that screening process looks like. Sure. So the, the first thing is what's the big why? Why would we do uh, screening for lung cancer? Well, lung cancer, unfortunately, takes the lives of uh, more uh, men than colon cancer and prostate cancer combined, more women than uh, breast cancer and cervical cancer uh, combined. It's by far the number one cancer killer. So it is, it is a huge target for us. Second, when 80% uh, of the patients are presenting in advanced stage disease, again, there's a huge opportunity for us to shift. So the NLST, the National Lung Screening Trial, uh, um, has been really the, the definition up until recently with the Nelson trial that we would screen patients who are 55 to 84 years of age, who had a 30-pack year history of smoking, uh, and who quit uh, within the last 15 years. So that's been the general population. The Nelson trial showed that uh, a younger population um, uh, uh, should be studied. And in fact, the, uh, the, uh, they identified uh, a survival benefit in women that far exceeded that of men. Um, so uh, we were also part of the ILCAP uh, study group and uh, we were actually studying people down to 45 years of age who had 18 pack years um, or 18 years of exposure as children to, uh, uh, to household uh, parents who smoked, you know, in the cars, in the house, that kind of stuff. We've also seen an elevated um, lung cancer rate in that group. But uh, the, the uh, NLST is the group and, and that's what uh, uh, CMS Medicare pays for and the major insurers support. We do have right now what qualifies for lung screening, as Dr. Mayfield mentioned, really uh, the, the NLST is, is enrolled in that way. So right now it's age 55 to 80, which is a little bit older than, than what um, the NLST enrolled. And we do, just to highlight what Dr. Mayfield said, is that there's, there's suggestion that maybe those are two stringent criteria. And we do have uh, NCCN group one and group two. Group two is a little bit more like he described it as far as less stringent and some of the other studies. And we have data from data from, from the U.S. and multiple centers um, that enrolled those less stringent criteria as well. And the incidence of lung cancer was really the same between those groups. But also there are now studies, um, really Martin Tamamagi out of Canada has, has led a lot of work in this, along with a, a group of other people looking at risk modeling and who really um, – what criteria would we really capture the most cancers while not over screening as some people are, are concerned about. And there's really a lot more work to do in this space. I suspect over the next 10 years, we'll see the criteria for lung screening shift substantially. And by doing so, we'll capture more cancers and hopefully also be better at uh, limiting the number where we see nodules that aren't really cancer and we're more able to determine that those are not cancer. So a lot of work to do, but lung screening is a wide open area for really the greatest possible advances in lung cancer treatment and cures. You know, it's estimated that if lung screening happened by the current guidelines for everyone who qualifies, if everyone got that, it's estimated that we would prevent an, an additional 48,000 lung cancer deaths per year. And to put that in perspective, that's more than the number of people that die from breast cancer each year. We want to cure all cancers, and I'm certainly not trying to pit any against each other, but really just for the sake of, of understanding what those numbers mean, it's, it's really um, curing lung cancer at a scale beyond uh, what we even see in breast cancer right now. So these, there's, there are big possibilities for this. What do you think about combining a um, cardio screening program with a CT screening program. We have an open dialogue in the, in the National Lung Cancer Roundtable, and particularly uh, Jim Molshine out of Chicago is very vocal about this. Um, the original NLST data showed an all-cause mortality reduction in those who underwent lung cancer screening. The lung cancer uh, screening screens the heart, you know, screens the lungs, the esophagus, the chest wall, the mediastinum, look, finds thymomas, thyroids, finds coronary artery disease, heart failure, 
uh, spinal disease. So uh, Dr. Molshein has really uh, uh, termed uh, the lung cancer screening as a health screen. And in those terms, then you're right, Mr. Dario, um, it is more than just a lung screen. Uh, we report a visual CAC score, which is a coronary artery calcium score, with every one of our uh, lung screens. Not sure yet what the statistical correlation is with uh, heart disease or risk for MI, but the lung cancer screen is a very good, uh, if you'll accept this terminology, uh, a look under the hood inside the chest for um, all kinds of disease processes. Yeah, um, you're right. So the coronary artery calcification score we know uh, is being measured and that correlates with a higher risk of cardiac complications. And so to your point, Bonnie, then that's a way of determining, okay, these people are at higher risk and what more can be done in those cases. Um, we've seen in, in um, the UK as well, they're kind of talking about a lung health check because this really goes beyond just looking for lung cancer. There's a lot more research to do in this space. But, but certainly tremendous potential and already proven a degree of benefit that is really pretty exceptional. So I, I want to make sure that I leave some time for some questions because we are getting some questions coming in. But I want to talk a little bit about and be able to explain to folks what the screening actually is. What does it look like? Let's start with what is a CT scan or a low-dose CT scan? A lung cancer screening exam is a low-dose CT. That is a one millisievert of radiation. It's uh, equivalent or less than that of a mammography. It's uh, about one-tenth uh, the amount of radiation of a normal eye-dose CT scan. Um, so it is a very quick, uh, takes 10 seconds of a scan uh, in, a, in a CT scanner um, uh, to get done. For those who are at risk, a lung cancer screening is an annual exam. It is not a one-time exam. We have, when we engage patients or subjects around a, a lung screening, we commit to creating a movie of the lungs, not just a one-time picture. And that movie of the lungs, year after year after year after we screen you, um, allows us to see the development of small nodules which are enlarging or the enlargement of nodules that are already present. It is that change in the size of the nodules that is the most significant determinant of whether or not um, it is a nodule of interest. Uh, so it's a low dose uh, exam. It should be done annually and uh, you know, read by specialized radiologists and it is changes in that scan that are the most significant thing. So can I discuss a little bit then about how, how we screen in the post-COVID era? Yeah. Um, everything really has changed. So we have created what I call touchless lung cancer screening. Um, used to be that you came to the imaging center, filling out forms on a tablet. There's, you know, 10 people in the waiting room. You're standing in line for the scan. Um, uh, you know, you'd be there for 30 or 40 minutes, something like that. So uh, everything has changed about that. So now uh, we pre-register you by computer and by telephone. So you can scan or, or take a photograph, upload your insurance card. You can uh, upload your identification and all that kind of stuff uh, to our scheduler. Uh, uh, the screen is scheduled uh, online and you're contacted by telephone. When the screening center contacts you by telephone, we give you the telephone number of the person at the registration desk. So I'm in a mostly a suburban environment. So people uh, leave the house, they get into their car, they drive to the parking lot of the screening center. They call into the desk, they say, I'm here. Person will say, I'll call you in five minutes. So when the previous patient leaves, then uh, the uh, subject getting the scan gets out of the car, goes in, uh, simply signs the form that they need to sign. They show their ID. They get a bracelet. So that's the only physical contact they have with anyone. They go directly to the scanner, have the scan, and then they walk out. There's no waiting room. There's no contact with anyone except the person who puts the bracelet on your hand. Uh, everybody's wearing a mask. Uh, the scanner uh, is uh, treated with a vir virucidal agent. Uh, the table is uh, that is allowed to dwell for three minutes and that's virucidal. That is much less exposure 
then if you go to the drugstore to pick something up or you go to the grocery store to pick something up. So uh, the lung cancer screening process in our health system uh, is uh, safe and uh, and it saves lives. You know, discounting former smokers, but never smoking lung cancer is still the fifth largest cancer killer. Is that correct? Is that still true? Yes, I believe that is true. Yeah. There has to come a day when we can uh, risk stratify those folks either by family history, by whether or not they have a BRCA gene that doesn't just you know operate in the breast but operates in the other organs uh, in the body, and or can we do blood tests? And this is where I would like the research to go, particularly around lung cancer screening, is can we do a blood test that looks for either circulating biomarkers or circulating RNA, you know, tumor RNA that we detect very early on. So with your CBC and your BMP and your, you know, just your annual blood work, is there a point at which we will start looking for, um, you know, malignant strands of circulating RNA and DNA that are shed by these tumors. That's a long way down the road, but I would hope that 10 years from now or 15 years from now, we're not using CT scans to detect lung cancer in early stages. We're using a, a blood test of that type to do so. Yeah, there's a lot of exciting research in this kind of biomarker space. Um, there are some small studies that, that where there are dogs that are able to identify individuals who have lung cancer. There are uh, some studies that are looking at really um, taking some of the non-cancer cells along the trachea and finding genomic changes that correlate with the presence of a lung cancer, even though the, what, what, what's detected in that sample is not actually the cancer itself, but it correlates with, and these, kind of, these kinds of studies um, maybe will guide us toward who then should undergo further testing if lung screening it by CT scan is still a thing at that point to be able to detect who who never those the individuals who never smoke which of those individuals are at higher highest risk for developing a lung cancer. There's a lot of work going on in that space and, and a, a lot that's advancing in our science to really be able to do some of that more detailed work in a more rapid way. Dr. Mayfield and Dr. Sands. I don't know if you have any final words um, of goodbye. Get your lung screening done. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs>